You see, the Apostle Paul was a Pharisee of the Pharisee at one time and believed that righteousness before God came about by doing religious works. Then he got a revelation that righteousness, D.K. Usine, is a gift. Jehovah said, can you, is the Lord our righteousness, is the way it's put in the Old Testament. D.K. Usine in Greek in the New Testament. It's a gift from God. It's not brought about by works. For nobody can be justified by the works of the law, religious works or otherwise. Let me read the last bit again. So God is the righteous judge, justifies, that is, places in a right relation with himself, within the new covenant of grace, those who believe the gospel of the Father concerning his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And he justifies Jew and Greek alike on precisely the same basis. That is, by faith alone, without works. And he makes no distinction whatsoever between the people of the old covenant and the Gentiles. Abraham, says Paul, was himself justified by faith alone. Genesis 12, 3, Genesis 15, 6, Genesis 18, 18, Romans 4, verse 3, Galatians 3, verse 8. In fact, Paul confessed that the power of the gospel to be the word of salvation to both Jew and Greek was based on the revelation of the righteousness of God therein. That is, God the Father acting justly for the sake of his Son, according to Romans 1, 16 and 17. You see, most people think, most religions teach, it's the doing of things, religious things or good works, right down to how much you read your Bible or pray, it's going to justify you and get you right for heaven. Wrong. The Apostle Paul got to know the difference between good works. Nobody's arguing with good works. As long as you're not using them, to think that they justify you and get you into heaven. Only the blood of Christ can do that. Paul understood the difference between good works and the gift of righteousness without works received by faith because of what Jesus did in Calvary. Obviously, if works did the job, why did Jesus die on the cross? Now, Paul bears this out in Romans 10. Let's go to our next graphic just so we have a look at where that scripture is found. It's in Romans chapter 10, and it's verses 1 through 10, and I'm going to read that to you right now. So come right back to me. Now follow me carefully in this. We don't have all day, as you know, but we can hit some of the highlights. Paul, speaking relating to the Jewish people, the dear Jewish people. I was raised in a home. My mother always taught me to love the Jewish people, and my father too. We were very, very devoted family toward Israel. Still are. Brethren, my heart's desire, this is what uh, Paul says, my heart's good pleasure is the word, and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Now that would be like praying that the Pope would become a Catholic. What do you mean he would pray for Israel to be saved? That was a kind of an insult to Israel because not only they believed they were saved, they believed they were the only ones that were or would ever be saved. But Paul knew better. He said, I'm praying that they will be saved. For, he said, verse 2, Romans 10, I bear them record. I'll give them this. They do have a zeal of God, but it's not according to knowledge. There's multiplied millions of all religions all over the world who have a zeal of religion, but it's not according to the knowledge of God's Word. It's the doing of religious things. And usually it involves the looking down on those who don't do those religious things. Paul said, I give it to them. They're zealous. But he said, they don't know what they're doing to obtain righteousness. And then, obviously, one of the greatest verses in Holy Writ, Romans 10, 3. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness, that is, D.K. Usine, of God's gift of righteousness, they, being ignorant of of the real doctrine of justification by faith, as the Bible teaches it, and Martin Luther brought it alive over 400 years ago, for they being ignorant of God's righteousness 
and going about to establish their own righteousness through religious works have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. And the word is decay, you They have not surrendered to realize you can only receive the covering of God's righteousness as a gift from God through your faith. Then he says in verse 4, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. The word is telos in the Greek for the word end. For Christ is the end. It can mean one or two things. You know, you could say a thing has come to an end. That means it's terminated. Or you could say to the end thereof. Or this was done to that end. Which is not so much the uh, termination as the fulfillment. So what does it mean? For Christ is the end, the telos of the law, for righteousness. Well, it means both. He was the termination, but he was also the fulfillment. Jesus said, I didn't come for any other reason but to fulfill the law. He said nobody else could do it. So Christ fulfilled its demands and brought to an end the Old Testament system which said, If you do not keep all of the law, which nobody can, then you're a goner. You're dead. In fact, the Old Testament says, whoever does keep all the law shall live. But it knows that nobody can. So what's the good of the law? Yes, it's good. It shows us God's standard, and it becomes a schoolmaster to point us to Christ. But Christ brought that system to an end and introduced a new system. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness, the doing of works to get righteousness system, to everyone that believeth. It's a new system. And the old system said, pay thy debt or die. The new system or God's new agreement, the New Testament says, I've paid it for you so you can live. 4 verse 5 says, Moses Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. True, but nobody can keep it. And whoever offends in one has offended in all. Like if you take a drinking glass and drop it on the floor and it smashes, it doesn't matter whether there's ten pieces or ten million, it's still broken. But he said the righteousness which is of faith that you get as a gift, D.K. Usene, speaketh on this wise, Say not in your heart, who shall ascend up into heaven? I mean, when Paul was trying to teach this message of righteousness, people would say to him, Oh, how could you do that unless you go up to heaven and pull Christ down? Or unless you go down into the grave and pull Christ up? That was for those who said that Christ had never rose from the dead. Paul deals with those two points, and he says these things here. I want you to get it. Say not in your heart that you have to go up to heaven to get this to bring Christ down, or to the grave to bring Christ up. But what saith it? What is our message? Verse 8, the word is nigh thee. The word is close to you. You're hearing it over television from this Irish preacher right now. It's even in your mouth. You can start to say it. So it's important to have it in your mouth. And in your heart, that is, the word of faith, not of the law, but of faith which we proclaim or we preach. What does it say? That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. It doesn't mean confess to others that you're saying. It means confess Jesus is Lord in your life. And shall believe in your heart. That's with your mouth. Believe in your heart that God hath raised him from the dead. Then you get saved. 